I have one embarrassing question, which is, um, can you tell me exactly how to pronounce your last name? Yeah, that's everybody's question. <laughs> Haji Shirzi. Yeah. Haji Shirzi. Haji Shirzi. Okay. Sorry, I probably still said it wrong, but I at least like, yeah. <laughs> no, it, it was good. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I see 80 participants. Oh, you are really big. Like, Yeah, it should be, we should get up to at least 100. It's, oh, wow. it's, actually, it's actually a required class for some students. Cool. Um, we're, um, I guess we could start, I, I guess I want to leave a couple more minutes in case anyone got confused and went to the lecture hall because we're like usually in the lecture hall and then occasionally remote, but um, we're kind of at the critical mass number where we can start. Thank you. Um, so, well, okay. So, so Emma, go ahead and introduce the speaker. Okay, <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so I'm so happy to introduce Hannah Hajishirzi. Um, so she's an example of someone who I think normally would be hard to get because we'd have to like fly her across the country and she's very busy and does lots of cool things and have lots, has lots of obligations. So due to the changing norms of COVID, I'm like really excited we get to have her speak virtually. Um, so she's an assistant professor uh, in the School of Computer Science at the University of Washington and a research fellow at AI2. Um, prior to that, she received her PhD from University of Illinois. Um, and actually did a postdoc here at CMU, which I feel like I didn't realize. Um, so that's cool. Welcome back, I guess. <laughs> um, she's won lots of awards, including an NSF Career Award, a Sloan Fellowship, and many others, including Best Paper Awards and Honorable, honorable Mentions um, at top conferences. Um, and of course, she's done a lot of really interesting work on machine learning for understanding and reasoning about text. Um, and uh, some work I'm particularly excited about, which I believe she's gonna be talking about today, um, is in the direction of robust models that generalize to new domains, you know, where we don't necessarily have infinite data like we do in some other cases. Um, and I want to remind everyone to please turn your cameras on. Um, I personally find it miserable to speak to sort of like a bunch of pictures or just like your names. Um, so please, if you're in a place where you're able to turn your camera on um, for our speaker. Um, and with that, I will let Hannah get to her talk. So thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Emma, for the introduction, and thanks a lot for having me uh, remotely. It's really my pleasure to give a talk here. Um, yes, I was at Pittsburgh, but I was mainly at Disney Research, so, and I was there for a short amount of time, just for one year, but I'm very happy to be back uh, and had love to visit in person, hopefully next year. <laughs> cool. So uh, in this talk, I'll describe some recent work in my lab that we are working on that going toward robust knowledge rich uh, NLP models. And, and I talk about a variety of different approaches that we are taking toward this uh, problem. Um, and I would love to hear your questions throughout the talk. I would pause at some places, stop for questions and um, at the end you can ask a lot of questions. Okay. Um, vast amount of textual data is available online in many different forms. So we have unstructured text uh, in many different forms like and, and, and genres, right? So we have news articles, we have text documents, for example, in Wikipedia, or even scientific articles, right? Uh, we have textual data in conjunction with other modalities like visual data, or also in structured form, for example, scientific knowledge bases or Wikidata. Therefore, this problem of understanding and comprehending text such that we are able to reason about it is a really challenging and fundamental problem in natural language processing. And researchers in NLP really like to evaluate our progress in NLP using different applications. For example, question answering, a lot of my work is around question answering, or fact checking, textual entailment, machine translation, and so on, right? We have given them, uh, given names to all these different tasks that all of them are trying to somehow evaluate our progress in this area. But now one important question that uh, we are asking in my group these days is, 
can we build AI algorithms or like let's say NLP algorithms that can generalize to new domains when we usually require complex reasoning or when training data is scarce. Um, just a very quick overview about the current paradigm in NLP. Most of you know that, I just wanna uh, summarize it. We usually have these days, we usually have a pre-training phase where people have taken some kind of self-supervised training objective and then build the pre-trained model. Many of us know they are somehow named after Sesame Street characters and so on. Then when we wanna solve one of those tasks that we, I just mentioned, people start collecting large scale data sets and we have a surge of these data sets, especially in the recent years. For example, this is kind of the, uh, the data sets exist some of the data sets exist in the question answering area uh, and you see a big mass in the uh, recent years. Then we start doing the fine tuning phase where we try to build task specific models over these data sets in which, for example, for question answering, we have the input as a question and the context. Uh, this input is uh, gonna be represented using one of our pre-trained language models. Then at the fine tuning phase, we take the annotated data and we train these task specific layers. For example, we're gonna extract phrases when we're dealing with question answer. Okay, now let's look at some more complex tasks. For example, we would like to answer this question. What percentage of the Washington state budget has been spent on education over the last 20 years? So how can we solve such, uh, answer such question? Probably the first step is to uh, retrieve the pages or the passages or even the figures, graph, whatever, that potentially consist some sort of answer or some parts of the answer to this question. And then we would like to go inside all these pages and documents, understand exactly what's going on in them, combine them, integrate all these different pieces of evidence, understand we are gonna solve this equation and then answer the question. So this is actually a set of uh, complicated steps that we need to know, uh, we need to do to address such questions. Or let's talk about this task, scientific fact-checking. We have seen this scientific claim, ACE2 receptors are involved in coronavirus infection, okay? We wanna see if, we can verify this claim or not. And the task that kind of we would like to follow would be to look at the scientific uh, knowledge bases, to look at the text in the scientific papers. Uh, and then for example, find a statement that says, patients treated with this drug experience a reduction in symptoms. And then when we connect all these dots, we say, yes, this uh, claim can be verified. Okay, so now, our goal uh, in my lab is kind of trying to focus uh, on addressing these type of tasks. Um, uh, here's the picture taken, I would say two years ago, around this time uh, when we were all on campus without masks. Uh, and this is kind of the goal we are pushing, which is we like to understand text, be able to reason about it, uh, mostly natural language processing, some using visual data. And our goal is to build models that are interpretable, uh, they are robust to domain shifts, um, and also we focus on efficiency in some of the projects. Here I'm mostly discussing some of our approaches toward robustness. Okay, um, so in the first portion of the talk, I'll explain about some of our general purpose models that are developed for known tasks. Like I said, we have a definition of task within NLP, in particular question answering, and here I would like to describe some of our recent efforts on building models that uh, are kind of trying to address these question answering across uh, English and also in other languages. Mm -hmm. Then I would start this, I would explain our approaches to, toward building neurosymbolic models on how to incorporate knowledge in the form of a structured knowledge or kind of unstructured knowledge such that we look at more complex tasks. And then finally, I'll uh, introduce two of our recent work on how to actually evaluate this robustness and cross-task generalization. 
uh, by changing the genre and also uh, by changing the task. Okay, so our first work, we call it Unified QA. And the goal is to build a unified model for question answer. As I mentioned earlier, we have a surge of data sets in question answering uh, within the last few years. These question answering data sets are being created because they are making specific assumptions about input and output. For example, they are asking questions about different types of context. They are being created in different formats. For example, we have multiple choice questions. We have yes, no questions, uh, extractive, abstractives or uh, open domain, right? So we have, there are many different formats of question answering data sets. And usually they are, in, uh, and more recently they are being designed because they wanna explore some reasoning challenges that were not explored before in the previous data set. Our intuition or kind of our argument here is that there is an overlap between the underlying reasoning abilities that these data sets have. Okay, and we can benefit from mixing all these different question answering data sets, even if they are a different format. Uh, we introduce unified QA, that's a general purpose question answering system uh, that works across many different question answering data sets and formats. And our intuition is that we like to build unified QA that sits somewhere between the pre-training step and the fine tuning step. Okay, and basically it uses multitask learning uh, to train a question answering model over many different QA data sets. Okay, how does it work on these are more concrete steps? We collect question answering data sets in different formats. We have multiple choice, extractive, generative, and yes, no. In particular, our version one started with including nine data sets. Then we unified the format of all these data, uh, all these instances or question answering instances. For example, if we have a multiple choice question like this, what causes sound? Then we put a separator between the original question and also the multiple choices. So now the input is just the text. And the output is one of the options, which is also in a text format. Then given that everything now is in a text-to-text -text format, we are able to use an encoder-decoder architecture. In particular, we experimented with T5 and BART. Uh, and then we train this whole thing with a multitask learning uh, 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 training approach. There are two important things to note here. First, in our multitask learning setup, we train simultaneously on all data sets. And we made sure that our batches contain instances from all these data sets. Second, this is different from a standard multitask learning. We are not building one head for every task, whereas kind of we are combining all these training instances together and build one model. Okay, so these are the list of data sets we have used. We have a squad, uh, one and two. We have narrative QA for abstractive. We have these multiple choice question. We have more multiple choice because the size of the data was smaller uh, and we have both here. Uh, and for format, for mapping them to text to text format, I described for multiple choice, uh, for things like extractive, it is easier because like we have the question concatenated with the paragraph that the question was going to be asked and the output is another text format. So the results are uh, really interesting. Our first uh, evaluation was to uh, basically let me describe the figure. So dark blue is unified QA, light blue is the dedicated models, uh, and these bar charts are representing, uh, I don't remember, is it EM, like exact match or F1 score? So kind of accuracy of how well we are answering these questions. And here at the bottom, I'm listing the data sets that we actually trained our unified QA on. As you see, the performance of unified QA is uh, some, most of the some kind of better or on par with the dedicated models that, that were designed for these data sets. So this is, this is very promising. 
uh, showing that even if we combine all these data sets together, we are not losing accuracy uh, here. The second uh, data, uh, the second result is to show that unified QA is generalizing well to unseen data set. Again, uh, dark blue is our unified QA and light blue is the state of the art on those data sets. And now these data sets at the bottom, these are new data sets, right? So we haven't seen them during training. Um, and as you see, we are getting close to the state of the art performance uh, in those data sets. And this is quite interesting, mainly because uh, uh, it kind of follows our argument, which was we know there are some similarities between domains, between reasoning challenges that exist in all these data sets. So with mixing up all those different data sets together, we were able to show improvements on some data sets that we, couldn't, we hadn't seen during training. And then the final experiment was, uh, what if we start fine tuning unified QA instead of a pre-trained language model like T5? Um, and this is, these are the results of fine tuning T5 on some data sets. And also uh, when we train or fine tune unified QA. And again, as we see here, we are making improvement over T5 fine tuning. And in particular, we achieve the state of the art uh, on 10 data sets. So um, a few kind of to summarize this part, uh, a few interesting points to mention. We show the successful application of multitask learning within the QA domain. We argue, we were arguing that the choice of tasks are important because for example, the original T5 paper also tried to combine all these different tasks together and map them into a unified text to text format. But they weren't showing that these models are as good as the dedicated models in that domain. And this is, this is really interesting and promising. And we argue that it is important to be aware of what tasks uh, we are choosing uh, to combine. Um, people have started using our system, uh, our unified QA, especially they use the kind of a version of our unified QA and show state of the art in some other data sets. Uh, they show that uh, this approach works well in few shot learning setup. Uh, kind of the Berkeley people built Unifu and uh, show that you can kind of follow the same paradigm for few shot learning. Uh, another interesting observation was that uh, there was a new data set evaluating some sort of science uh, questions. Um, and they showed that unified QA, even in the few shot learning, works better than GPT-3. And again, we were arguing this is happening because we have taught unified QA on how to answer questions. Um, and also it's inspired future work in the multitask learning across other types of tasks. For example, people have made uh, similar approaches for answering common sense questions um, and so on. Okay, so I'm happy to take questions now before moving on to asking, uh, talking about multilingual QA. Sorry. If there is any. There was one clarification in the chat and then, um, and then Nate has his hand up. So I guess first Jack's question from the chat. Uh, there was an example that flashed by where the uh, target answer was 1906, but from my hasty reading, it looked as though that was the year rather than the correct answer. So the question is, are you trying to simulate or emulate human performance, or are you actually trying to get the no, right answer? No, that was a typo. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank, thanks a lot for noticing it. I'll, I'll make sure to fix it. Yeah. I am no, a human, the human performance. It was supposed to be ground truth answer. Yes. Thank You're you. welcome. I am a human bug magnet. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. So there are some hands up. Um, uh, I think Nate might have been first. And yeah, then, yeah. And yeah, I think Nate had his hand up first, although I'm not sure. Uh, I just had kind of a simple question. When, when you fine tuned, I. Uh, T5 and GPG-3 on these tasks, did you fine tune them like on the on the specific data sets or did you fine tune them on like the whole data set that you used to train 
the um, the universal model? And 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 have you tried both? I guess is my question. Um, we haven't done. We haven't fine tuned GPT three just T five. Uh, so I know fine tuning GPT three is a is is a plan. We haven't done that. Right. Uh, the few, okay. It was few shot learning. Uh, yes. For few shot, we all, like this. This paper exists before GPT three, so we didn't have like we didn't even play with GPT three on this project. But um, for like you basically took T five and then fine tune it on kind of instances on the collection of instances from all those data sets, all those nine data sets that I mentioned, basically. Um, and then when we started the, the, the fine tuning step, when we are looking at new data sets, again, like we treated it as if it's T5, right? So we kind of thought, okay, unified QA is our new pre-trained model. And then we took unified QA, fine tune it on this new data set. So we kind of looked at it as an artifact, basically, yes. Okay, thanks. Sure. Um, Ed? So, so that leads actually to my question. You said, as, as you said, T5 showed its superiority on many, many tasks. But then when you trained T5 just for QA, it got better. So you said, oh, okay, we must choose what we train our machine on. So that leads to the question, if we look at types of QA, maybe we discover that there's kinds of QA that we should break QA up into smaller types, like there's the inferential type QA, and there's the sort of replacement type queue. If you look at race, for instance, the different five or six different classes of queue yeah. questions we identified in race, do you think it would make sense to go one level down and do further and further differentiation or is question answering as a thing, the place to stop is enough? Uh, excellent question. I was discussing this with Seiwan, my student, uh, who was also an author in this paper, exactly about the same topic. I was discussing that Right now, we have given these kind of, I wouldn't say artificial, but some names to these tasks that we are evaluating, right? But I argue that a lot of data sets in uh, question answering or a lot of instances in question answering evaluate same reasoning ability as a lot of instances in natural language inference, right? So who would say that I should combine all these QA data sets? We did it because like we have this boundary defined, we have all these data sets. So I, will, I really think we should be able to define some sort of reasoning ability <laughs> um, thing here that it's a very kind of hypothetical or philosophical concept here. I don't know how to quantify it now. Uh, and then try to find instances, exactly as you mentioned, in race, there are some reasoning type instances, maybe there are some in N relevant NLI data sets and so on, and then try to build models for them. Or even further, I don't know how, but maybe we need to build some mixture of experts model that kind of knows when, to, when we are talking about that reasoning ability uh, pushes for that. Excellent question. I don't know how, but I think we should do something like that. Yes. Okay. Um, I I see that Jack has another question. Jack, go ahead. Uh, thanks. I was just Googling how to raise hand in Windows uh, and still haven't found the answer. Um, <laughs> you mentioned that you have generative questions where the uh, answer can presumably be Legitimate answers could be phrased in more than one way. So do you uh, score them that they have to be exact matches verbatim or match or just semantically? In yeah, which um, very good question. For all these data sets, we were actually following the evaluation metrics that they had on the original data set. I think they had the Rouge score. I'm not sure. Maybe for the narrative QA, for example. I'm not 100% sure yet. But yeah, yeah, uh, I don't believe it should be verbatim. I think uh, it was more like a type of Rouge score. I think, yeah. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So uh, I would move on to the next uh, topic here, which is uh, our very recent work on, which is just uh, accepted at New Rips 2021, um, and I want to argue that most of the current work, especially in question answering, is only on English questions, right? How can we go beyond English, look at other languages? 
Okay, just to give a very brief definition of what we mean by this term open retrieval question answering, people call it different names like open domain, open QA and so on. So we are calling it open retrieval question answering. And here is how it works. We have the question uh, coming in. Usually people cross-reference this question over Wikipedia, uh, which, which has a large collection of articles. Uh, and then build a retrieval reader model that in the retrieval stage, uh, we're gonna retrieve a few passages or articles or paragraphs, depending on like, what granularity you wanna look at, uh, that are potentially containing the answer to this question. And then a reader model that tries to kind of extract the answer here. Okay. Uh, most of the data that we have are limited to English data, right? So how about going beyond uh, English? Um, there are some data sets uh, in the multilingual domain and most of them are translations from English questions, which are causing some issues. For example, there are a lot of questions in Japanese asking about uh, US uh, uh, football or like the Super Bowl or things like that. So. Uh, there was a new data set from Google called tie-dye QA that they were trying to take uh, 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 kind of uh, hum like humans in the original language to write questions for them. And in our work, uh, uh, X or QA, we basically took uh, tie-dye QA questions that were unanswerable within the original language because we have a lot of uh, kind of information scarcity in a lot of languages, especially low resource ones. Uh, and we try to find the corresponding answers in, uh, either in the original language or in English. Okay, so, so I'm not talking about X or Q. I just wanted to give you the overview of how it was collected. Uh, so meaning that X or QA was an open retrieval kind of non-English data set but most of the answers in a, a question, like let's say in Japanese, could be either find in Japanese or in English. Like this is how, this is the nature of a data set. There was also, there is also a recent data set called MKQA from Apple uh, that again, it is uh, collected by translating questions uh, to many other languages. The methods that are working on these data sets are following this pattern, this pipeline first. You look at the question in one language, let's say Bengali, you translate it into English, okay? Uh, then use one of the English question answering system, find the answer, uh, translate the answer back to the original language. So uh, this works okay, but it has obvious issue. First, our performance in QA is bounded to the performance of the translation. And also, uh, why should we? Are, why should the answer to a Bengali question be, be found into an English uh, data uh, Wikipedia? Right? Maybe we can find this answer in many other uh, language sources. Okay. So we argue that to build a question answering system that works well across many languages, we should be able to have a system that is able to retrieve passages and also answers cross-lingually, not within, not only from English and the original language, okay? Uh, and also another reason for, or kind of this is by uh, making the, the, the points of necessity of cross-lingual retrieval is because of information scarcity and information asymmetry, right? So first of all, there might be, that we know low resource languages are limited, so, maybe we can have a higher chance of finding answers in other languages, okay? And uh, also maybe they are not kind of, like the Wikipedia pages are not completely con uh, aligned with each other. There might be some detailed information that can only be found in, for example, English Wikipedia. Okay, so it's important to be able to do cross ringball retrieval. Um, this is uh, our approach to build the uh, multilingual open QA. Uh, our system is able to do many to many cross-lingual answer retrieval and generation. It does not use any specific machine translation or retriever module, uh, and it achieves the state of the art in these two data sets, XORQA and MKQA in 26 languages, especially the one with low resources. So how do we do that? Uh, we are basically following the same pipeline as English QA, 
but we are building multilingual dense passage retrieval and multilingual answer generator. Okay, let me explain how they are. At the retrieval step, this is how the input looks like. The question comes in any language you want, and we're gonna cross-reference it with Wikipedia's on many different languages. Um, we would encode the questions and passages into some embedding space, and then find maximum inner product search, uh, find the, for the passages that are likely to have the answer. It can be in different languages. It can be from the original language. It can be English. It can be even some other language. So I also want to highlight that uh, the approach, like this kind of overall pipeline, is very similar to dense passage retrieval in English. The differences or the important uh, differences that we have is now things are being done cross-lingually, right? Um, yes. And then the generator module, where it takes the passages in different languages, uh, we are training a generator that is able to generate the answer in the original language where the question uh, was asked. Okay, so I'm not going into the details here. I'm just giving you the highlights. Uh, uh, the, and the highlight or the important kind of challenge that we needed to tackle here was the lack of training data, the lack of cross-lingual training data between different languages for retrieval and answer generation. And the way we resolve this challenge by doing this iterative training pipeline. First, we initialize a multilingual DPR. Uh, how did we train it? We used our X or QA data set where the training is being done between the languages and their correspond and, and for example, English, right? So they are just we are doing cross-lingual DPR, but it's just between different languages and English, right? So it's not like mix and match of different languages. Then using that, we're gonna train a generator module where it gets this collection of documents, English or the original language, and then generates the answer, okay? So it kind of brings in English, mix it with some language. Now, here is where we're gonna expand the data. How do we expand the data? Uh, we try to kind of bring in some heuristic and incorporate Wikidata uh, for this. Basically, we looked at the answers, uh, the answer spans, try to see what uh, kind of Wikipedia pages they have. Uh, we translate them into other languages or kind of look at the Wikidata pages that are linked uh, to this particular answer, but they are in other languages, okay? But now we have one whole article uh, in many different languages that are potentially answered to one question. What we want is the correspondence between the question and just one passage into the whole, in, in that whole article, or basically we like to extract paragraphs. And the way we're gonna do that uh, by using our trained generation module, it's already trained, it can do something, it's not perfect, but it, it, in the first iterations, uh, it is able to find the answer. Uh, so now we are getting closer to some passages uh, using our mgen. Uh, we automatically label those passages as correct answers. So obviously there are some noises involved, but overall we saw that was uh, very useful. Uh, and now we have a better MDPR and MGen because uh, we have better collected data because now we are bringing in some other languages beyond English. And then we start doing another round of iterations of training MDPR with this new collection of pair pairwise questions and passages. And again, uh, retrain our MGen. And we did it uh, for, I think, two or three iterations. Yeah, and we stopped. Okay. Um, so using that, we actually got a uh, really interesting results. Uh, here are our results, like the dark blue is our system, lighter blue is kind of a baseline um, the, that uh, was used before. Um, we show we are getting improvements uh, in, uh, on average and also on many different languages. I'm not listing all of them, but the biggest improvements that we saw was on languages uh, that we didn't have much, that they didn't have much resources in, like for example, Telugu. Uh, 
Um, another interesting result was the, the system that was trained on XOR QA, we evaluated it on MKQA, okay? MKQA was not used uh, for training. It was just used for evaluation. Of course, there were some languages shared between these two data sets, but there were also some completely unseen languages as well. Okay, so on average, again, uh, the dark blue shows our system. Uh, we saw improvement. Uh, and uh, especially, again, we saw most improvements when we are dealing with uh, low resource settings, and especially when they are not seen at all. Okay. Um, so I'm going to stop here and wait if you want to ask questions. So there are a lot of ablations and everything in the paper. I'm not going into them uh, to understand which steps were important, well, how many iterations were helpful, and so on. Uh, just showing you the overall result. Cool. Okay, I can move on. Um, okay, so here I described some of our recent work on building unified models for these known tasks and show how we can go beyond English language. Now, we like to uh, look at a, a bit more complex tasks and see how we can elicit knowledge to kind of provide information for us uh, to do a better job in these uh, complex tasks. In particular, I will describe our work on multi-hop question answering uh, and also on common sense reasoning, where for multi-hop QA, we actually elicit knowledge from a structured data or a structured Wikipedia. Uh, and for common sense reasoning, we show how we're gonna elicit knowledge from the parameters of a language model. Okay, so um, let me define multi-hop QA. Actually, hotpot QA was made by uh, here at the CMU, but I just give you a very brief overview of what I mean by when I say multi-hop QA. We have a question like this. When was the football club founded in which this player played at center forward? In order to answer this question, we need to know who is the, what is the team that this player played? And then once we have the team, we are able to find, okay, sure, uh, where this uh, team is founded or when this team was founded. Um, in order to do this uh, open question answering, again, we have retrieval and reading pipelines, but now the challenge that we are facing here is that some passages or in particular, the important passages that are likely to have the answer are actually really hard to retrieve. Why? Mainly because of the little lexical overlap that these passages have with the original question, right? So for example, what we really like to have here is the list, the, the team, that team among the retrieved passages, whereas we only have the player in that uh, kind of question. So it's really hard to know what is, how we can retrieve that team. But there is a very cute clue here. These passages that are hard to retrieve, they are actually connected over this structured knowledge graph, for example, Wikipedia, right? So we know that team is connected to the, uh, to the, to the player uh, page. Um, and that's how we are uh, addressing this multi-hop QA task here. We use Wikipedia graph to guide the retrieval. We learn to retrieve reasoning paths and train a retriever reader framework. Uh, and we show we are getting good results uh, in different open QA data sets. Okay, so what do I mean by a Wikipedia graph? Uh, very simple, basically we connect pages together if there are hyperlinks uh, between one entity in Wikipedia and also the kind of the, the hyperlink page. So we just follow uh, the Wikipedia, the, the, the hyperlinks in the uh, Wikipedia. Um, and then we start, uh, retrieving paragraphs uh, sequentially and build these reasoning paths over the Wikipedia graph, right? So we basically think that the Wikipedia graph uh, allows us to kind of uh, uh, form and guide the reason. For example, this is one reasoning path. Uh, we know we were interested to the team of this player uh, and they are connected according to the Wikipedia graph uh, and this is how this thing, uh, this, this guides our reason. The way we retrieve these paths uh, by learning and training a 
um, an autoregressive model. Basically, we train a re uh, recurrent neural network uh, to retrieve passages one by one when we are conditioning on the previous passages that were already retrieved. Um, this is the pipeline. We, we're going to uh, sequentially retrieve top K reasoning paths. How? Uh, uh, here are the kind of retrieved passages. And then uh, by training this recurrent neural network. Uh, where at each stage of the, at each step of the RNN, we want to see if we should add that passage to the reasoning path or not. And then we continue until the end of evidence token uh, is collected. Okay. And we use beam search to make the search efficient. Uh, once we've done that, we looked at the top K reasoning path. We don't just look at the top one because we also want to see what is the correct answer relevant to each of those reasoning paths. Um, and then we find, uh, we use our reader model, find out what is the best answer given the reasoning path one, what is the best answer given the reasoning path two, uh, and then finally we rank this whole uh, retrieve passages and the answer and decide what is the most likely retrieve passage, okay? Um, just one quick uh, summary of how we actually extract answer given each reasoning path, uh, it's, it's quite simple idea. We basically look at the, the final passage uh, and then run a reader model over there. Uh, and then now that we have multiple options, we have this kind of classifier to evaluate what is the score, what is the likelihood of this path containing the answer. Uh, and then we select the one that has the highest likelihood. Okay. So uh, obviously when I show you this work, uh, our results are good, uh, especially in the hotpot QA data sets, our gains are the highest. Uh, um, and we also show some improvements in the squad open or natural question. Um, and I believe these numbers are quite old. This paper is from 2019. Uh, uh, I know that there, there are a lot of improvements on these data sets now. Again, we have a set of ablations to understand which step was helpful, like how many steps in the reasoning path we should take. Uh, in hotspot, it was mostly two or three because like usually the reasoning hops are two or three. Uh, but overall, using this kind of autoregressive model, we can stop whenever it's needed uh, of where to stop this reason. Okay. Um, Cool. Uh, the large gains that we are having is kind of using this sequential retrieval and the graph structure. That was kind of the most important thing. Uh, we also had some improvements of the kind of the verification step and the re-ranking process. Uh, also, one very important step that helped us was carefully designing negative paths uh, uh, in when we were training our RM. That was also very helpful. Okay, so here we show that this structured knowledge that we've used in uh, Wikipedia is actually helping us in answering factored questions. But now I want to move on to the questions that require implicit reasoning, in particular in common sense. Okay, I think so. Vijay has questions. I, I will just stop for a second. Yeah. Uh so my question is that I assume that you used human generated knowledge graphs here. Uh, do you think that there would be improvements if you used uh, automatic knowledge base completion or construction to uh, enrich the amount of entities in your knowledge base? Uh, very good question. Um, I think uh, yes and no, right? Depends on the quality of that knowledge base, right? So for example, I work a lot in the scientific uh, knowledge uh, bases. So there are some of those knowledge graphs that are super high quality. On the other hand, there are some that are completely automatic and very low quality. Uh, so I, I think they might actually hurt the performance if the quality of the knowledge bases are low. But if they are high, especially like if we think, because, because we know the knowledge graphs are huge. So if, for example, when you construct a knowledge graph, which, for, which more for precision than recall, I would argue that this is helpful. Yes. Yes, Jack. Um, thanks. I finally found how to raise my hand in, in, in Zoom. Um, I'm curious how your system would compare to Watson, both in its performance 
and in how it works, because it seems like you may have a, a much simpler generic architecture that in principle could do everything that it does if it had access to the same uh, data. Yeah, very good question. Um, the answer is I'm not sure because I know in Watson there are a lot of engineering efforts also going on um, that I don't know. So, so I don't know that how much of that engineering was actually important in building Watson. But let's, and, and I know there were some kind of in, Bill, let's say, okay, uh, we are talking about one step questions, right? Not kind of deciding what question, uh, like not, not the whole jeopardy system, sure. So the, I believe that uh, one important aspect of Watson was how to integrate different pieces of evidences across varying styles of knowledge bases. Here we are kind of thinking that there is one knowledge, knowledge, giant knowledge graph, let's say Wikipedia, and this is kind of guiding our reasoning. So uh, I would say in this vein, if we are in our retrieval step, if we start, uh, because, because we are running our first retrieval to find the first page that are kind of somehow related, and then it start following the link. So if that step is relatively successful in finding, okay, now I want to look at this portion of the graph. Now I want to look at that portion of the graph. Then I, so I think maybe that's the part some sort of engineering is required. Then I believe this type of following these paths would be actually really effective in Watson, yes. Uh, second thing that I think would be helpful is in the Watson project, I believe there are going to be a lot of training, useful training data available, which would be helping our system um, to kind of train and learn these reasoning paths. That again should be should be a, a plus for us here. Yeah. I bet they would buy you lunch if you contact them. <laughs> cool. Okay. So now let's look at uh, these type of questions that, so remember the last question that we talked about, this was, it was kind of a complex question, but we noticed that there are some compositionalities are going on, right? We knew we we're gonna find the team. And then when we found the team, we can kind of answer the question. So we kind of decompose the question in a, in a way and then answer the question. But there are some types of questions that they require reasoning, but the reasoning is more implicit. Let's look at this example. This is actually coming from Reno Grande data sets, a common sense reasoning test. I picked up a bag of peanuts and raisins for a snack. I wanted a sweeter snack, so I ate the blank for now, okay? As a human, when you wanna answer this question, you are contrasting between these two choices, the facts and foils, okay? Uh, and uh, you are contrasting them according to some attributes that you think it matters in answering this particular question. For example, you would say, peanuts are salty while raisins tend to be sweet. And then now I wanted something sweeter, so I picked the raisins here. Now, the questions that we are trying to address here is, can AI models actually contrast between these facts and points? <clears throat> And the goal that we like to push is we like to extract these type of targeted knowledge from language models or uh, kind of let's call it prompting. Uh, I think a lot of you are familiar with this literature. Um, and our goal is to prompt the language models to kind of pick into them and probe the knowledge that we really require to address this task. We, the, the argument that we are having here is that there are a lot of knowledge hidden in the parameters of these language models, but which of them are useful for our particular task, we like to elicit them uh, from a language model by kind of a useful prompt. But how do we prompt them? Uh, we basically form some uh, templates uh, kind of general purpose templates, some things like this. P are more blank than Q. P have blank while Q have blank uh, and so on. So we basically for these closed style templates and ask the language models to fill in those blanks for us. Um, and this is how our system works. Just before explaining the system, I wanna mention one point, which is, um, People have shown that for these type of common sense reasoning tasks, 
When you fine tune pre-trained language models, especially the large scale language models, they are doing awesome. They are really good in distinguishing between these different choices. So one thing we want to push here was to look at this problem mostly in a kind of zero shot or few shot setup um, rather than fine tuning. Okay, so how do we do that? Uh, we basically design some contrastive prompt. Uh, we obtain these prompt templates by doing some in-house annotations of some Reno Grande and Pika data sets. I don't know if Jonathan is around here, but like the, his data set. Uh, and uh, we notice that when humans are writing this type of contrastive prompts, they are not going crazy. Like there are, like there are a limited number of these type of templates. So like I, I would say about 30 of them. Um, there are some forms like P are more blank than Q, P have Q while Q have Q and so on. So you can look at the paper uh, for the list of these type of pattern. Um, and then once we have these templates, we actually show these prompts to language models and then ask the language models to actually fill in those blanks, okay? So we might come up with some contrastive explanations like peanuts are salty while raisins are sweet, peanuts have salt while raisins have sugar and so on. So here, uh, obviously it's kind of uh, manually designed uh, templates. I'm not saying the language models did that well of putting these uh, things definitely correctly. So obviously there are some noise into these uh, patterns or these prompts, uh, this type of knowledge that we are extracting from language models. But we basically showed all of our templates to the language models and asked them to fill in those blanks. And then we use these contrastive explanation for the final task. How did we do it? Uh, kind of quite simple. We concatenate the task instance where it had a P and Q, the facts and foil, and then we concatenate it with all these explanations, okay? Um, and then we use the task model. We had different versions of this task model. One completely zero shot. We basically looked at the, these outcomes that you are seeing. Uh, are the language model scores, and also one that we fine tune it for those particular data sets. Um, here I'm showing the, the zero shot results. Again, in our fine tuning results, we also saw improvements, but more interestingly, our results in zero shot, we saw definitely higher gains. Um, here are our comparison. The dark blue is uh, our uh, contrastive explanation system. The lighter blue, this one, is a system that does not use any explanation. And then this middle one is we let the model just produce some explanation in the wild. Like we are not guiding it to say, OK, we want to make sure you have contrastive explanation. Um, and here are the results across different data sets, uh, different common sense data sets. Uh, and sh we show that basically our contrastive explanations uh, outperform the previous system. Okay. Uh, so one other result that I couldn't, I, I, ha I don't know why I haven't listed it here. I forgot to show that result was pushing for the interpretability angle of these models because one really cool experiment that we did was we wanted to swap the facts and foils and the sorry and the fact and facts and foils in the explanations. Like we mentioned, raisins are salty while peanuts are sweet, and we want to see how well the models perform. Uh, can they kind of decide that we are switching these uh, uh, facts and foils and then actually answer the correct question or not? And we saw that. Uh, so obviously, it wasn't the case that for all cases. Uh, the models uh, operated correctly, but we saw that the models that are relying on contrastive are at some points they are actually using these explanations to finally come up with the final solution. So, so it gave us better way to evaluate the faithfulness of these models of how much they are actually trusting these explanations. Okay, cool. So. Uh, let me quickly move on to the next two topics. Uh, I think I still have time. Uh, I'm, more ex I'm very excited about introducing these two challenges for you and invite you to work on these uh, challenges. So the first one is 
fact checking, but in a scientific domain. Let's revisit the example I had at the beginning. We wanna understand if this scientific claim is verifiable or not. ACE2 receptors are involved in coronavirus infection. Um, remember I explained that we have seen this sentence, an expert would be able uh, to understand that this is a rationale to argue that this scientific claim is correct, okay? But in order for a system to actually understand it, they need to take a few steps. First, they need to have this information that this drug actually disrupts this ACE2 function. Obviously, I didn't know that, right? So, so uh, these are some, some things that uh, like scientific experts would know. Another thing is having some statistical numerical understanding, for example, uh, the system needs to know that when we say P is smaller than 0.01, it's actually statistically significant. Uh, the model should have the capability of dealing with long range context. For example, we say these patients have reduction in symptoms and at the top, we were talking about coronavirus, right? Uh, but earlier in this paper, we saw that these patients that they were studying, they had COVID-19 symptoms, right? So again, some sort of co-reference is required. And also the causal and effect where uh, when something dis uh, disruption reduces a symptom and then this is involved in infection. So kind of this causal effect relationship to say, okay, all these together would tell me that this, rash this rationale actually proves that uh, this claim can be supported, okay? But now, how can we tackle scientific fact-checking, right? Uh, or can we build models that uh, are able to, do, to deal with scientific claim verification? We construct a SciFact data set. We define a task and develop some baseline models, uh, and we verify the, the baseline model in verifying some real-world claims. Previous work in fact-checking, uh, they are kind of categorized into two important categories. One natural claim, the other is synthetic claim. Natural claim, for example, those claims are taken from newspapers or political science or things like that. Whereas in synthetic, people actually ask humans to write claims. It's definitely really challenging to collect natural scientific claims. Like we have to ask experts to start writing down some claims for us. But we came up with some observation, which is citations uh, or kind of related work section in the papers are actually expressing some claims about some other paper, um, about some finding that was found in that paper. So we thought, okay, these statements mentioning related work can be some good clues about the claims that we have uh, about scientific claims. And that was kind of the, the way we've collected this data. Uh, we looked at the citing paper, uh, we looked at the citation sentence, uh, and usually in the citation sentences, there are a lot of complications, like there are complex sentences, uh, they group a few papers together, mention some important finding, so here we basically had some biology students to start kind of uh, simplifying these statements and then make them into atomic statements. And then once we have that, uh, we look at the cited papers and see if actually these cited papers are verifying or are supporting these claims. So this is how our kind of positive instances are being collected. But sometimes, uh, after our simplification step, the claims are being changed a little. So maybe the cited paper actually refutes this claim or sometimes some papers uh, are citing some other papers in a wrong way. So because of both reasons, we had some papers supporting some papers refuting those claims. Okay, so uh, here is uh, our uh, data set. Uh, obviously it's much smaller. Uh, than the counterparts in kind of um, uh, political news or Wikidata, Wikipedia. Uh, Fever, the kind of most popular fact-checking data set, it's synthetic, so obviously it's much larger. Uh, uh, and our domain is in biomedicine. Um, the task that we are pushing here is that a claim uh, comes in, we would like to have a claim verification system. 
uh, that looks at the abstracts of a scientific papers among a corpus of scientific papers and tell us that these statements are actually so are rationales, for example, for supporting that fact, uh, that claim, or this statement is actually refuting this fact. So this is kind of the goal that we are pushing. We like to find the rationales and also the labels, if it is supports or refutes. Um, we have created a simple pipeline uh, where the claim comes in. Uh, we actually retrieve the apps, like kind of follow the retriever reader framework as, if, as in uh, open domain QA, uh, that we look at the list of abstracts that are potentially related to this claim. Uh, we select these statements within these scientific abstracts uh, that are either kind of su supporting or verifying this. Again, another rational selection module. Uh, and then within the abstract uh, and within those sentences, we want to predict if it is verifiable or not. And then finally come up with the final label. Okay. Uh, so this was the baseline. So we have this as a challenge in a scientific uh, text processing workshop in NACL this year. And now a lot of new systems are actually making a lot more progress in this data. Uh, so here was our initial observations that uh, uh, if we are dealing with gold abstracts and rationales, um, the, the number is quite high. Okay, so meaning that if I have the, uh, if I know the statement that is supporting uh, or kind of somehow related to that claim, uh, we are good. Like if we train a system on fever, like pre train a system on fever and then fine tune it on our data set, we are able to find the labels. But then it gets more challenging if we do not have those specific statements or those specific sentences. If we know the abstracts uh, and we want to find the statements and the labels, the task is getting a bit harder, but it's still not too bad. But then the full pipeline of finding the abstracts or kind of the retrieval and also uh, the final claim verification step, um, this is actually much more challenging. So one other thing to note here is that this data, like we have a collection of scientific articles. Uh, I, I don't remember the exact number for the full pipeline. Now we are in the process of making it uh, open domain, like look at the whole uh, collection of scientific papers that exist in uh, semantic scholar. And now the kind of the annotation is becoming much more challenging, but we are trying to kind of uh, release this data because the task is becoming much more interesting that because dealing with scientific data, we are seeing that there are a lot of statements that are being supported, meanwhile refuted by similar papers, so but by different papers. So uh, we are expanding the data set as well on this. Okay, so um, this is the, uh, the demo also available uh, on, our, on the LNAI website. Uh, we also did some real uh, claim verification. We asked a medical student to write 40 COVID-related claims, uh, and we showed that our system is able to kind of correctly support or refute some of these claims in 60% of the cases. I want to also show you some very interesting okay, issue with our system. Um, we try to evaluate this claim, COVID-19 is a biological weapon. Our system says 99% support. Uh, but if you look at this article, it says 94% of respondents thought that this is a biological weapon. So there are a lot of issues here. First, uh, if this source is credible or not, right now we have a lot of these type of scientific papers. We do not know if they are credible or not. So this is actually a really open problem that how can we trust these sources? Uh, and also uh, uh, kind of uh, how good this paper is and so on. So this is actually a really important uh, di direction that we like to explore. And I also invite people to explore. Um, yes, so in future, I think there are many important directions uh, that can be studied in this domain. Uh, one is 
in order to actually understand if these scientific claims can be verified or not, can we actually build this kind of multi-hop reasoning approach that looks at many different things together, not just kind of a, a simple open domain QA style approach. And also how can we look at the source credibility of these scientific domains? Okay. So yes, I'm done with this part uh, and I'm happy to take questions now. Cool. So let me move on to this new work. This is on archive. Um, this is a, a very recent work. I'm very excited about this and would like to hear opinions and uh, comments and everything. Um, we are creating a data set, we call it natural instruction, that its goal is to evaluate AI models to see if they can generalize to new tasks just by getting a natural in language instruction. Okay, so let's look at this example. Uh, this example is taken from a Vino Grande data set. Um, we are looking at this person X yelled at person Y because blank was so upset about the news. If I show like let's say GPT-3 this example, what it would do, it would think, okay, I need to fill in this blank, okay? But who says that's the only task you could do uh, with this example, right? So we really like to be able to ask our machines to do a task when we are describing the task to them, okay? We might come up with this description, say answer a fill in the blank question, or even more constrained explanation. Your answer might contain a word present in a context, okay? Humans would be able to answer this question. They would say, okay, given all these constraints, the answer is person X. Or I might uh, ask uh, the system to do a different task, modify a fill in the blank question on person, or even give more descriptions saying, you need to minimally change the question so that the answer flips from person X to person Y. Again, humans are able to do this, um, and we have an evidence they have collected Vino Grande data set using uh, crowd workers. And these are the, the instructions were given to crowd workers. And now they are writing it like this, person X comforted person Y because uh, blank was so upset, right? So now the answer has changed to person Y. So humans can follow these type of instructions, evidence, these were the instructions to collect Vino Grande data set. Now, can AI algorithms actually do that? Uh, this is our kind of the goal of our natural instructions data set. So we have created a meta data set that includes many tasks and their crowdsourcing instructions and annotations. We are defining this problem that we like to build models that learn from instructions rather than learning from lots of instances and in examples. We have built kind of the basic model here uh, and we showed some empirical evidence that uh, instructions are in fact helping to generalize, but obviously there are a lot of room to improve. Okay, so how the data is being collected or has been collected, we looked at the existing data set crowdsourcing instructions and collect their instances. Um, but the crowdsourcing instructions, they were super complex, they were all over the place, like people use different approaches to do that. We tried to unify these type of instructions by first defining minimal tasks. Uh, what do I mean by minimal tasks? Because like when people create data sets, they do kind of uh, several steps of the talking with their crowd workers, like first generate a question, second answer this question, third like, change or filter this type of question. So we kind of looked at these minimal tasks here, and then we tried to define an instruction schema and then map those raw instructions into our schema. Our schema follows kind of, uh, tries to follow most of the things that are happening in these instructions. And then we updated some other instructions like this. In particular, it includes the definition of the task, it includes some uh, kind of constraints that people are, uh, or the, the, the data set creators are de defining to explain more like things to avoid, 
they are putting some emphasis on something or some prompt, which is kind of a very short uh, description of the task. And then sometimes they provide some positive examples and also some negative example, like definitely don't do this or like avoid, make, avoid making examples like this. Okay. Um, so our natural instruction data set currently consists of 61 tasks and instruction. These are mainly NLP tasks. We have looked at the NLP data sets. Uh, we have questions like we have task categories like this, question generation, answer generation, classification, incorrect answer generation, verification and minimal modification. Um, we have 160K instances uh, from all over these data sets. This is our instruction schema. And this is the task basically. We have the input instance, which could be a paragraph and a question, like kind of very kind of aligned with whatever uh, actual task was designed. Um, and also the instruction of doing the task and the goal is to actually perform the task, okay? Given the instruction and the input instance. Um, so the way we've modeled it currently or how our baseline model looks like is to encode the instruction and input instance together using a text-to-text -text architecture. Um, and we are doing a very simple trick of like, now that we have the schema, we would write it like definition and then the sentence, things to avoid and then the sentence and so on. So this is kind of how our input is being uh, represented and passed to these text-to-text -text architectures. We are uh, using BART because we wanted to be able to fine tune on our data and also GPT-3 for the purpose of uh, few shot evaluation. Um, it's important to note how our training and evaluation setups look like. We make sure that the tasks that are being used for training are not seen in the evaluation, right? So we wanna, that, that's, that way we wanna see if we are able to build models that can generalize beyond tasks. And we have done different setups, one random split. So we might see some question generation tasks even in different types of domains for training or completely leave one category out. Um, and then we evaluate on the unseen test. And this is the kind of input setup, instruction plus the input. Uh, and finally, we wanna see what is the output. Uh, here are our results for GPT-3. Uh, uh, and we are kind of ablating different components of the instruction schema, just the prompt, prompt plus definition, full instruction, and then removing the negative examples. Um, and the output we are evaluating using group. Um, so we see that kind of it, when we are using more complex form of instructions, we are gaining more. Um, so we are seeing some improvement, some generalization capability. Interestingly, negative examples are actually hurting the system. So uh, we think GPT-3 is still not able to understand that these are negative examples, like it thinks it's positive. Um, and hurts the performance actually a lot. Um, we also evaluate the kind of fine tune, uh, kind of model is task specific models. In particular, we train BART for those particular data set instances uh, and kind of to show, to evaluate some Oracle experiments, even though the model sizes are not comparable, but as you see, we are still far from doing the tasks by just looking at the instructions. Um, these are our results with BART. Uh, again, same thing. Uh, we are seeing improvements when we include more uh, components of the instructions. The numbers are lower from BART uh, compared to GPT-3, obviously model size. Uh, and again, same thing, negative examples hurt performance. Um, so the good observation is that the small models are also able to somehow generalize to unseen tasks. Uh, one other, uh, so now in this setup, we completely left one category out. Again, uh, we see some improvements uh, in adding more instructions, but the numbers are much lower, right? So like if we have not seen answer generation at all, uh, then the performances are much lower. Okay. Uh, so this is a project page. Uh, our goal is to 
design systems that are able to learn from instructions rather than from uh, examples. We saw some positive evidence here, uh, but there's still huge room to improve. There is one important observation here, which is when we start training uh, by increasing the number of observed tasks from 10 to 20 to 40 to 50, when the models see instructions versus when they don't see instructions, as you see, we are seeing improvement in the performance, right? So models are getting able to learn and understand what are they being asked, okay? So this is a good and positive signal. And right now our data set consists of 60 tasks. So now we are trying to kind of add more tasks to it. Uh, we actually have a call and a lot of people have started contributing already. I think we've got about to about uh, 300 tasks now that people in the community have started kind of uh, mapping their instructions to our schema. So we kind of improve the data set. So uh, please contribute your data sets if you are interested in um, this, this type of evaluation. Um, Oh, this is this is a little old because yesterday when we were talking, we are about three hundred tasks, um, and yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Uh, so I would like to stop. Uh, just one uh, final slide here that we really like to build more. So so I think we are at the level that we have managed to solve a lot of data sets. Right? We like to go beyond data set solving uh, community and just focus on building new data sets, solving data sets. So how can we build AI algorithms that invent new solutions to solve new tasks? Uh, following instructions, is it one approach? Uh, should we change our modeling uh, designs, like maybe integrate symbolic and neural models? Uh, overall, we really like to go beyond pattern matching, uh, have, be able to do complex reasoning and so on. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Let's thank our speaker, however we can, clap uh, visually or with an icon or whatever. Thank you. Um, we, we can take a couple minutes for additional questions. Um, okay, I think, uh, Shuyan? Oh. Hi, uh, thanks for the nice talk. I'm wondering for the last part, uh, what's your thoughts about like how the instruction are helping the, the improvement? Yes, exactly as you noticed, uh, we have some sh tasks that are shared between our kind of uh, our domain, right? So for example, we are asking the system to answer questions, right? They are, they are designed with different reasoning capabilities in mind, but we still know that we need to answer a question. So, uh, so, so the system has started understanding that, okay, when I answer it, when, I, when the system asks to answer a question, this is how it should work, right? So if they manage to, they, they manage to see a lot of these type of instructions, even though some of them might be different from the original um, instruction, the systems might be able to follow that kind of, uh, I, I, I don't like to get into a lot of kind of philosophical discussion, but, but we are thinking about it's kind of like the meta learning idea that the models might be able to learn from these demonstrations, from the instructions and so on. So, so we thought that can be one way to push these models to go beyond uh, just solving data sets, even beyond tasks. So, uh, because again, the, the answer that the idea that I mentioned earlier that these tasks that we are defining in NLP, they might be kind of artificial or like they are designed for some purpose of like, okay, question answering is one task, NLI is one task. So maybe you can define those tasks and then let the model do the job. Thanks. Um, do we have other questions? Sure. Okay, Jack, and then Nate, um, and then Ed. What, if anything, can you learn uh, by detailed analysis of examples that it gets wrong? Does it give you clues as to what sorts of knowledge or capabilities uh, might be 
accounting for the other 60% that, that you don't get right yet? Oh, um, a lot of it, right? So especially these tasks that we were dealing with, like when I say answer a question, like it's like uh, extract a phrase there, right? But it might require multi-hop uh, reasoning and things like that. So obviously the models are still not able to deal with those. Like, uh, and we are still an analyzing the system better, but there are still a lot. So I, I would say we've just covered the basics. Um, that's, that's my answer. Thanks. Great talk. Okay, uh, Nate, and then Ed. Um, my question is actually really similar. I was just, I wanted to ask, since you pointed out that the negative examples tended to hurt the performance, do you know what type of task, like what types of tasks it was best at, or it seemed to like most readily learn? I would say, uh, our data set currently had a lot of question answering uh, setups. Like that was kind of, uh, those were the people who initially responded to us. So I would say in answer generation and fill in the blank type thing, they were best, I would say. Um, but uh, yeah, I would, I, I would argue we we'll need a lot more data to cover for those things. Like for example, the example I gave, change the question such that the persons change like we were awful uh, like the, the on those type of kind of question modification type tasks so uh, yeah because because it required a different type of reasoning at that point yes but negative examples we are still analyzing them i don't have a good answer yet uh, because because we have different hypotheses it can be we, we know like GPT-3 is getting worse when the prompts or like the input is longer. So is it because we are just adding more and more data it's hurting? But that was different, right? Because we, add, we had some other modules in, uh, cut the negative examples and it, it still saw improvement. So there, is, there was obviously something wrong with negative examples, but we are still trying to understand and analyze things better uh, in that, that uh, area. Yes, very good question. Okay, so I have a question. When I think of the, thank you for the talk, I really enjoyed it. In the beginning of the talk, you showed us that if you just take T5 and you run it on many tasks, it can do QA quite well. But if you train on just QA of all kinds, you can do better. And so I asked you, well, is it QA? You know, should we break down QA in different types? And you said a very interesting answer. You said, no, we shouldn't look at subtypes of QA. We should look at kinds of reasoning, inferential yeah. reasoning, paraphrased reasoning, whatever. So I thought, hmm, how many kinds of reasoning are there? It makes to me a lot of sense that if somebody gives me a question, sometimes I have to think about the reasoning and do modus ponens or some kind of logic. Sometimes I look at the, the language and I say they phrased it in an odd way. If I paraphrase, I can say it differently. Sometimes I think I just, just put a synonym in here or maybe another language expression or some other thing and then it can. Exactly. So then I thought, okay, there's a whole bunch of different sort of reasoning actions I can do and it's not particular to QA it could be for language for in-depth reading right for for understanding texts it could be even for machine translation or other applications so taking the focus away from the application and putting it on the styles of processing and using QA as as a vehicle for it, inspecting this is great then you came with the rest of the talk and I thought great first you said let's go look at taking QA and putting in things like Wikipedia and stuff and so we essentially are looking at different ways of saying sort of the same information, packing the little language model, you know, n-grams inside the, the new, uh, T5 or whatever, and expanding them with sort of sort of loosely sp spoken paraphrastic or synonymy type, uh, you know, variations of expression. Then you said, okay, now let's go multilingual. And then you said, okay, now we've got all kinds of other languages. And every time we do this, we're enriching the, the, the sort of, core you could think of it or I'm thinking of it as I got my core question and I'm, I'm putting a lot more stuff around it I'm just making that core question all kinds of different variations of that core question even in other languages so maybe I'm going to hit better on the answer so that's what I took away from the talk you showed yes. 
to the middle of the talk to the second and third stages, this sort of thing. Then in the fourth stages, you start looking more at particular kinds of inferences and filling in pieces and, and looking at the patterns where now you say, I've got a template. I'm defining for you the inference pattern I want you to follow machine. And I'm telling you, here's my pattern, fill in with this word and this word. When you fill in this word, you say, here's a reasoning pattern, an English expression, and it shows you how different things hang together. It's not like an inference in the sense of modus ponens, but it is a way of saying A fits with B with C and as in this position and C with that Z is the location for blah, 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 right? Something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, right? So now I'm thinking, how many different kinds of reasoning style would one could one think may exist or how would you go about this is an open-ended question not an answer right how would you go about deciding whether it makes sense to say there is reasoning style a or b or c in the sense of a logic reasoning style and this yeah. and the paraphrase type reasoning sort of more linguistic style or is it better to think of reasoning in sort of domain saying there's psychological reasoning, there's sociology, friendship, interpersonal type reasoning, there is physics type reasoning, there is human emotion type reasoning. That is to say, put the reasoning patterns either on the linguistics and the, the way language works, or put the reasoning pattern analysis rather on the domains of our experience in the world and explore either of them to make your QA engine better. Do you have a preference? Awesome point. Very excellent point. I don't know. I think we got, okay. I, I honestly don't know. Okay. But, so this is an excellent question. And the reason we are kind of getting into this is, as I said, we are asking people to co uh, contribute their data sets in our task. And you saw in our 60 task setup, kind of we the categorize that we, when we define these task categories, we follow the norm like QA, answer generation and so on, right? And then when we started looking at this really large set of tasks that are being uh, input to our model, we are like, how should we categorize and should we call all of it as answer generation? Whereas there are obviously different types of answer generation. And that is exactly where that question has come to us that how do we categorize them better? Um, I think if because of for this particular kind of extension of the data set, I think we would mostly push for um, kind of logic reasoning, like compositional uh, reasoning, or is it common sense reasoning, or like these type of uh, challenges that people have developed their data sets for. I think we're gonna follow what they have done, but I hundred percent agree with you. We need something better. Uh, or maybe we maybe maybe we don't or okay and, and another side of me thinks maybe we don't need all these details that maybe we need to find a better way to group things together say okay all of these require some sort of linguistic reasoning I should put them together so so I'm, I'm just uh, blabbing I don't know I don't know the answer but the next concrete step for us is to, to look at our new uh, collection and try to kind of follow the reasoning challenges that the creators of data set kind of label their data with and then it start grouping them according to that. That's Excellent. our next goal. If I could just follow up, Laurie, is that okay? Just one sentence. I could yes. see an answer exactly along the lines you said, where you say, I'm, I'm going to look for kinds of reasoning modes or reasoning patterns. Mm -hmm. And when I have two or five or six, however many there are, I will sort of understand how they work. Then I will go and look at the domains and collect the reasoning modes to say, this is how psychological reasoning works. This is how emotional reasoning works. This is how physics reasoning and social reason, society, you know, interpersonal reasoning. Each one of them fits. It has basic rules and that, that knowledge, the common sense knowledge in each of those domains fits into different some fit into pattern A, some fit into pattern B, some fit into, I just have to figure out first the patterns or the modes of reasoning, and then second, these domains and how I pour them. Ultimately, I will then have a machine that can take any question and decide, oh, this is an emotion type question and it needs reasoning pattern C. And so I fill them in and boom, I'll be able to give you the answer. That, in a that's the goal, way. yeah. That's, that's the goal that why the instruction should do. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So excited. I love to see your work as you continue. Thank you, thank you. 
Okay, yeah, this is great discussion, but we only have time for one more question, and I think that Yingshan was next. So that'll be our last question. Um, thank you for a great talk. Um, I'm wondering for your uh, natural instructions data set, uh, how do you make the model automatically adapt to different answer format? For example, if you have a true or false task, then, then we really stack a classification token uh, on top of the CLS oh, token. Oh, we, and, we map everything text to text format. Like text comes mm -hmm. in, the, the classification label is a text format, yes. Uh, we have a follow-up work uh, again. We are we are working on that. Uh, we we put it on archive soon, or maybe we put it already. Uh, we are when we are looking at these classification setup, we are trying to add a little bit more constraints, like pick among these, for example, four or five choices. Like we are bringing in some human intervention to update these, in, like kind of expert intervention to update these instructions. But other than that, for this particular work. Everything is just text to text, simple text to text format. We are not uh, doing anything fancy. Yeah. Uh, so you mean, for example, for a multiple choice task, uh, the text output is actually A, yeah. B, C, D, or repeat. Oh, no, it's the, like the, the, the text of A or the text of B. Uh, yeah. I see. OK, I see. Thank you. Sure. Um, OK, um, so I, we're actually over time already. And um, I, I, if you would like to stay on Zoom and keep talking, that's, that's fine. Um, some people will probably have to leave, um, but thank you so much for the interesting talk that stimulated so much discussion. Thanks and, a lot. Uh, I enjoyed it, yeah. thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to stay if people have questions. Okay. Thanks a lot. Oh, great, okay, so if, uh, right. So anyone who wants to stay and keep talking, you're welcome to stay. For people that are in your, if you're at the LTI, there are snacks outside. Um, so um, you could grab a snack and come back or you can just stay in the Zoom room and keep talking. So, okay, so please go ahead. Thank you. I think I have, my question is kind of a follow on to, to Edward's. Sure. Um, I, I put it in the chat just in case, but uh, I presume that you're familiar with Doug Lennett's psych. Um, what reasoning and background knowledge does a psych use that you don't get, but uh, might in the future? Because that's a different way to look for uh, sources of improvement than just looking at errors. Oh, I see. That's a very good question. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so I... Uh, I don't know the answer, but but my uh, so my colleague uh, Yejin Choi is actually trying to collect some type of common sense data sets, kind of using crowd work, crowd sourcing, and so on. Tries to kind of, I would say it kind of complements psych and the type of knowledge that exists in psych. So in this in uh, in this view that we would have is. We don't care where the source of knowledge comes from, right? We will take everything in, just pass us. Hopefully we can mix and match all those things. Like we would have this mixture of expert things that would take the benefit of everything. Um, so, so I'm just making things up. I don't know. I think we are. It, it's very far in the future. Um, so, so, so the way I'm, so, so again, if you, if you notice here, I'm also mentioning, so my background, my PhD background was in kind of logical reasoning. So, and then I became interested in NLP. Uh, so, uh, so I, I am very much keen on building models that integrate symbolic and neural models. So I think that might be related to kind of some of these well-formed, well-defined type of knowledge that we might get from psych. So, so I, I honestly don't think it would be just one model that everything is like training GPT-3 can do everything. So, so I'm, I'm pretty sure we should do some improved modeling as well um, to be able to integrate all of these sources of information. Yeah, I, I sorry, I didn't answer you well because I don't know. That's okay. It was more of a suggestion than a question anyway. Yeah, yeah. Doug describes psych as uh, representing the knowledge that is not in the encyclopedia, 
but that you need in order to understand uh, what's in the encyclopedia. And uh, so that's what makes me think that it might be a source of the reasoning patterns that you're exactly. interested in, exactly. uh, which he described as, as micro theories. Yes. Uh, so he had a different way of organizing that type of stuff. But if it's useful, look at it. Great. Absolutely. Again, uh, yeah. Scott Faldman also worked, I believe, on a common sense knowledge base with a very different sort of foundation that was more languagey. I um, see. Thank uh, so you. That, those might be good places to look at. But again, thanks. Really cool. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Ed? Ed? I think Ed? Sorry, yes, I'm muted. If no one else is talking, I, I just have a response to Jack's question. And also, I mean, looking at the recent work since, say, 2000, after neural networks came into NLP in, in, the third, in 2013, looking at the work since about 2018, when people start realizing that a neural network has knowledge and is a knowledge base, but also does transformation and is therefore an active agent. So it's both procedural and declarative knowledge, so to speak, using the 1970s terminology. So now we sit with people like Yejin Choi and others who say, let me learn common sense knowledge from the web and from BERT and from anybody else. And let me pack it, let me just discover it and put it in there and look at the knowledge base kind of um, dimension perspective, right? The problem is that often language doesn't have that explicitly. We don't talk about common sense, so we have to infer it. So there's all these projects to try to infer common sense knowledge and build it by hand, like atomic and comet and all those other things. Okay. There's that side. Then there is the old style knowledge representation reasoning, you know, the, the Cohen and Levesque and all the guys who wrote logic rules and modus ponens and inference and all those things. And we're now some people are trying to train machines to do to implement some of those kinds of reasonings, like the people who do table type QA, or even like some of your work, right? Where you say, I get something, I must transform it through some kind of reasoning into something else so I can give you back the answer without explicitly looking at the knowledge that's needed per se. Exactly. And, and now we have these machines in the middle, like, like, right, like T5 or others that we are now, we're beginning to look from both perspectives and we both see, it is a knowledge machine and it's a processing machine and it's a, it's a big mix of the two. And I don't know how to drive this thing. I don't know how to teach this thing. All I can do is train it some more and pray, right? That's where we're sitting today with our, this is the mess we're sitting in today, right? Yeah. So we have to, I think your work is nice is that you begin to tear this apart, but I think there's a lot more work we need to tear apart the processing the, the, the active knowledge, the transformation of notation and separate out the actual explicit representation of the knowledge that is used to do the transformation, to, to support the transformations so that we can get explainable machines that can say, I did reasoning step 15 with knowledge types A, B, C. Today, a neural network cannot tell you that, so it cannot give you an explanation. If we tear those apart and systematize both sides, then we can hope to get something better. Do you agree? No? Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I definitely agree. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I definitely I, I don't know how yet, but I believe I, I believe that should be like the, the, the solution should be something like that. Exactly. Exactly. We cannot just sit say, okay, they're bigger, let's pray, see what happens. I agree. Yeah. That's right. And so these people who play with GPT three and all the GPT three jockeys and things who try to make it by luck say the right thing without having any clue as to what the hell they're doing, it's just pathetic to watch, right? It is I just... mean, they are useful. I, I, I agree. They are useful because we, we have got to a level that we can start seeing this progress and actually building this final reasoning model. This is how I'm, 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 I'm viewing it. It's very useful for me because now I can start building all these type of learning from instructions. And so before it was, it was not feasible, right? The model performances were not that great. So, so I, I actually embrace it, but I, I believe, so I think it's a, it's a, it's a parallel type of research that we need these big models to help us uh, also push for the kind of reasoning and other stuff. In the old days, people did knowledge extraction by text mining off the web, right? You run to Google and you pull out 15 things and you match your patterns and then you get the answer. And so you do the, the cyclic text, the pattern learning. Today, we do exactly that same, but we don't have to read, we don't have to use Google, we just use BERT because it's read all the way. Yeah, That's exactly. all it's done, it's shortcut, that's a that step for us. But it's hidden the knowledge now in ways we don't easily see. So we have to do all the pattern engineering again, all that stuff from like 2000, 
1999 to 2005, six, how to learn patterns, all Ellen Ryloff's work, some of my works, you know, whatever, you go learn patterns again so we can pull them out. Yeah, exactly. And then we pull out all the knowledge, right? Yeah. Just actually, yeah, actually Graham had a nice survey paper here on that we were doing um, knowledge engineering, then feature engineering, then architecture engineering, then objective engineering. Now we do prompt engineering to understand exactly what are these. Yeah, I agree. Exactly, yeah. I agree. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I need to run, but thanks again. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for the discussion. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.